Good evening. Welcome to the offices of Catholic Charities of Oregon. And all of you, both those of you who are here in person and those of you who are here online. I'm Natalie Wood, the Executive Director of Catholic Charities. And, you know, we work on your behalf. And so I'm just delighted to see you here and delighted to see you participating. As an opening reflection, I'd like us to meditate on a short passage from our mission statement. So if you just bow your heads for a moment, please. Center yourself. Oops, in the Holy Spirit. Catholic Charities of Oregon believes that all people are created in the image and likeness of God and possess dignity, value, and worth. Our response to this intrinsic human dignity is to recognize, promote, and defend it from all forms of attack and to create the social conditions in which all people may flourish. Dear God, help us live up to these ideals. Amen. Holy Spirit. Thank you. Now, some quick logistics. So you can see we have coffee, tea, um, cookies, and a few other appetizers over here on the side of the room. At the tables in the lobby, you'll find artifacts from the past of Catholic Charities. And I don't know if you've had a chance to look at those yet, but they're really interesting and they're really something to see, that's for sure. Um, if you don't, if you haven't had a chance to look at them prior to this, I ask that you please um, take a look on your way out because some of them will surprise you. It's got some nice pictures and stuff there. Um, also, if you have to go to the restroom, you go out the door, up to the hallway, take a right, go down about halfway down the hallway, take another right, and the restrooms will be on your left. And if you feel so inclined, we have a donation box at the door and some QR codes available so you can help us support the people on the margins. So we would not be able to do this without you. So um, I just want to thank you ahead of time. And now we'll go on to our topic. So initially, what came to be known as the Tobin Lectures were annual talks and workshops led from about 1940 to 1960 by Monsignor Thomas Tobin. He was the undisputed Catholic thought leader in Oregon in the mid 20th century. Monsignor Tobin appeared in the papers and on radio regularly discussing the social implications of belief. During World War II, civic officials called on him to mediate labor disputes with Portland shipbuilders. Everyone respected him. Monsignor Tobin's gatherings tended to focus on the church and labor relations, a topic on which he was an expert. He walked the talk, supporting a move by workers at the Archdiocese of Portland headquarters to form a union that still exists. In 1985, a small group revived the lecture idea and officially named it after Monsignor Tobin, bringing in national figures who spoke on the economy, labor, and racism. With the new Catholic Charities Tobin Lectures, we'll explore themes of Catholic social teaching with a local twist, convinced that faith has serious social implications in our everyday life. We thought it made sense to begin by laying a historical foundation of Catholic charitable and social justice work in Oregon. That includes the start of our own agency, which began 90 years ago this month. We'll be observing this anniversary throughout the year. Our speaker tonight is Ed Langlois, Communications Director for Catholic Charities of Oregon. Ed spent 30 years as a reporter and editor for the Catholic Sentinel, official newspaper of the Archdiocese of Portland. He and the other Sentinel staff reported on social topics such as homelessness, immigration, assisted suicide, racism, and the environment. Ed was vice president of the Catholic Media Association and holds a master's degree in pastoral ministry from the University of Portland. He's a member of the Oregon Catholic Historical Society, a grandfather, and a proud Portland bicycle commuter who distinguishes himself, he says, by stopping at red lights. Please welcome Ed. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. 
Uh, I'm really grateful that you trust me to continue this venerable lecture series. I, I covered it often as a reporter, and I always found it intriguing, although it always tended to happen during the baseball playoffs. Uh, so I guess now you know my priorities. Okay. Imagine it's a hot, blustery afternoon in August 1844. Six women step off the sailing ship Indefatigable, which is bobbing amid whitecaps on the Columbia River at Fort Vancouver. The wind whips the women's dark habits around, making them appear all the world like a flock of blackbirds. Soldiers, sailors, and Kalapulia warriors at the fort gaze openly. Catholic nuns are something new at this remote outpost. The sisters of Notre Dame de Namur could handle a few stairs. They'd already survived the seven month passage from Antwerp around Cape Horn and up the rugged west coast of the Americas. They'd withstood storms, icebergs, fog, hunger, and near shipwreck. It was all good training because soon they'd need to face something even more daunting, orphans on the Oregon frontier. This is the beginning of the organized charitable work of the Catholic Church in Oregon. These nuns from Belgium, seasick for months, amazingly boarded another boat at Fort Vancouver and were paddled up the Willamette River to St. Paul. There, working with Father Francis Blanchet, the first Catholic priest in the region, they opened a simple wooden orphanage, more of a cabin really. They taught, and lovingly raised both indigenous youngsters and the children of settlers. The sisters had to finish construction on their own convent themselves and faced more trials, such as an 1850 typhoid epidemic that killed 13 children. The sisters were the first in a long line of strong women who have conducted Catholic social action in Oregon. Through the decades that followed, other nuns and Catholic groups serve the evolving needs of a community that was moving quickly from frontier to a booming society based on timber, fishing, and farming. The state's secular structures could not keep up with human need. Despite anti-Catholic bias in the 19th century, Oregon's founders were happy to have priests, nuns, and Catholic laity handle society's thorniest problems. Mother Joseph Parisot and her sisters of Providence were giants in pioneering education, health care, and orphanages in the whole Northwest. The Providence sisters arrived in 1856 with Mother Joseph herself laying bricks and pounding nails. Their powerful influence in health care has endured. Soon, we'll be dedicating our chapel in this very building to Mother Joseph. The Holy Name Sisters famously opened Portland St. Mary's Academy in 1859. Fewer people know that the sisters also welcomed orphans and homeless girls. And there were so many children in need that the sisters established a boarding school for them at their Lake Oswego campus. That came to be known as the Christie School, named after an archbishop. And eventually it would become a Catholic Charities program. In 1869, members of St. Mary Cathedral at Southwest Third and Stark in Portland opened a chapter of the St. Vincent de Paul Society, serving the poor of Portland with food, clothing, and cash aid. The society also donated land for the city's first hospital with the Providence Sisters in charge. The first patient was a Chinese immigrant cut up in a Chinatown gang fight. As Portland went from stump town to regional market center, other communities of women religious arrived. The Sisters at St. Mary of Oregon began serving at the Boys Orphanage in Beaverton in 1891 and would do so for decades. About the same time, the Good Shepherd Sisters opened a house for wayward girls in Portland. In 1895, the Sisters of Mercy built and staffed a home for the aged and ran it for more than a century. This photo comes from about 1959. The Mercy Sisters in the early 20th century turned a hotel at Southwest 14th and Jefferson into apartments for single women 
naming the building after St. Joan of Arc. The St. Anne Charitable Society, a group of Catholic lay women, had 70 members in 1901. And that year, the society helped 70 Portland families of any religion with food, clothing, and money for rent. The Cathedral Ladies' Aid Society, a forerunner of the Catholic Charities Development Department, began to raise money for other Catholic charitable groups. That included the Cathedral Sewing Society, which taught the art to girls so that they could make a living. On February 19, 1902, a leading Portland priest named Father James Black delivered a public lecture to a secular civic group called Associated Charities, and that was a precursor of the United Way. Imagine a smoke-filled room and scores of citizens in their Sunday best. The clean-shaven Father Black told listeners that the basic motive of Catholic charity is loving humans because they are images of God. He expounded like this. Charity arising from this motive comes not from the activity of human passions, such as human pity or human love, but is the highest expression of active intellectual appreciation of the relation between creature and creator. Father Black concluded this way, Catholic charities, small c, are directed to the alleviation and removal of the needs and sufferings of humanity, and where possible, to uplift both moral and physical condition and lead forward the object of charitable effort to the road of self-supporting existence. Not far from what we say today, is it? it? It turns out these people from the past weren't so dumb after all. Remember, this was the height of the progressive era. The nation was dazed by the industrial revolution and the earth-shaking shift from farm life to the city. Citizens began to pay greater heed to the struggles of regular people. In this context, Father Black planted seeds for more organization among Catholic charitable enterprises in Oregon. And the seeds did not take long to spring up. At the start of World War I, the Archdiocese of Oregon City, later renamed the Archdiocese of Portland, sought to unify the multiple ministries to children being carried out by nuns and lay groups. And so Archbishop Alexander Christie founded the Catholic Children's Bureau, a forerunner of Catholic Charities. The Bureau's manager was Father Edwin O'Hara, a pioneer in church social ministry and later Archbishop of Kansas City. We'll hear much more about him later. From its small offices at Southwest Third and Stark, the Children's Bureau advocated for young people, sometimes standing up to the powerful and the rich. The leading field representative was a fiery woman, sadly known today only as Mrs. T.J. Murphy. One can just picture Mrs. Murphy, hat on low and straight, marching into schools and businesses with righteous intent. When the Great Depression arrived, Oregon Catholic leaders sought to apply the Children's Bureau coordinating principle for people of all ages down on their luck. Father Lucian Lowerman was a Portland priest who had studied social work in New York. He was charged with cataloging and evaluating the widespread pieces of Catholic social ministry in the Depression era Archdiocese of Portland. In September 1933, Father Lowerman presented his report to a group of clergy and lay leaders assembled by Archbishop Edward Howard. The result was a vote that established the first Catholic Charities Office, where Father Lowerman employed four staff members. Their principal tasks were to coordinate the many Catholic social service institutions and act as case managers for needy children. Among the workers was a woman known now only as Miss Green, a graduate student, and the powerhouse Mrs. Murphy, whom we met a moment ago. The new agency also was tasked with raising money for all social ministries, in part by securing grants from the Portland Community Chest, a secular fundraising clearinghouse. The Catholic Charities Articles of Incorporation said the pursuit would be to, quote, care for, 
educate, maintain, and direct the moral, educational, physical, and religious welfare of children. The article cites adoption and court custody hearings as among key activities. Archbishop Howard had grand hopes. He wanted the new Catholic Charities to bring aid and relief to every needy child and adult in Western Oregon. The new agency did address varied needs. As one example from 1935, a 15-year-old boy hitchhiked from New York to Portland where he contracted spinal meningitis. Catholic Charities took care of the hospitalized boy and kept his parents posted across the country. That same year, Catholic Charities in St. Vincent de Paul teamed up to establish a chapel reading room and shelter in downtown Portland. The places were meant to support low wage workers and the many people who were unemployed during the Great Depression. You may know of the downtown chapel, which is still there. St. Agnes Baby Home for Abandoned Infants and Orphans was near Oregon City. It became a key project of the new Catholic Charities Agency, as was a nursery for low-income families. And to the dismay of Catholic children statewide, Catholic Charities frequently acquired shipments of cod liver oil to be distributed at Catholic schools. Employment was a focus, with hundreds of jobs listed each year. During World War II, the number of job postings at Catholic Charities went up to 700 annually. The agency, led by various priests for its first 25 years, was a kind of referral desk, with caseworkers meeting those in need and referring them to the Catholic Social Service Ministry that would best help them. Early on, Catholic Charities not only helped people, but tried to change how the public thought about poverty. Father Valentine Moffenbeyer, the second director, sought in the late 1930s to explain Catholic social teaching to parishes. When he was a boy, his own family had faced deep poverty after the death of his father. Many pastors resisted a social work program, thinking they were catching a whiff of communism. But Father Moffenbeyer showed films, gave talks, and won many over by explaining how the programs of Catholic Charities reflected the gospel, not Vladimir Lenin. From early on, Catholic Charities helped everyone, not just Catholics. And from the start, a lay board of directors guided the ministry. Under the board's guidance, the agency soon began entering contracts with the state, being paid for ministries that cared for orphans and troubled teens. The contract system worked so well that other Catholic Charities agencies around the nation copied Oregon's arrangement. In 1942, the nine-year-old agency held its first fundraising campaign. At that time, the cost of providing home, care, food, clothing, and medical attention for a child was $30 per month. That first campaign raised $24,000, enough to help 67 children for a year. Catholic Charities, with offices in various downtown Portland buildings, began its refugee resettlement work after World War II, welcoming many families displaced by years of battle in Europe. They came from Germany, Hungary, and elsewhere. This photo shows the Wolters family from Holland. In 1955, Rosalia Plekel and her family were welcomed by Catholic Charities having fled Yugoslavia in 1944 and having spent an uncertain decade in Austria. In this photo, Rosalia is front and far left. 60 years later, she would tell the Catholic Sentinel, I wouldn't trade this country for anything now. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, there was a move in the Truman administration to turn welfare control more closely over to state officials. That would wrest some authority from religious institutions that had been doing the work for decades. Father Jerome Schmitz was executive director of Catholic Charities of Oregon at the time. He said in his understated way, this was strongly resisted. But government ideas mostly won out. All the same, Catholic Charities adjusted 
and survived. I want to note that about this time, a group of University of Portland alumni were inspired by the work of Dorothy Day and began a house of hospitality for men in Portland's old town. Food, sobriety, and jobs have been the mission of Blanche House, which is still an anchor ministry for men in Portland, as well as at their farm near Carleton. It's an important part of the Oregon social services arc of history in the Catholic Church. As for Catholic charities, Service to needy families and refugee work would continue as a mainstay in the mid 20th century. Indonesian refugees began arriving in the early 1960s, as did Cubans after the Castro coup d'etat. Starting in 1975, Catholic Charities resettled thousands of Vietnamese refugees in the Portland area, helping form a vibrant and a leading community. Much of this important work was led by the energetic Cecilia Barisovic, who was an agency refugee worker for more than 50 years. Cecilia once told the Catholic Sentinel, we follow the church's commitment to people everywhere. We are dedicated to fulfilling this commitment to migrants and refugees who are really part of our family. Meanwhile, Catholic Charities also focused on domestic poverty. In 1956, the Family Services Division helped about 1,100 households on a budget of $32,000. Workers placed children in foster homes, processed adoptions, and served unwed mothers. A team of staff and volunteers regularly visited elders to assess and fulfill needs. In the 1970s and 80s, Catholic Charities operated a home for boys on Leahy Road near Cedar Mill. This photo from Christmas 1983 shows Father Morton Park in the back, an amiable fellow I remember well, and uh, who was Catholic Charities Executive Director at the time, and Cecilia Barisovic is there in the front. A few years before Roe versus Wade, Oregon legalized abortion ahead of the schedule, and a new Catholic social ministry began in the state. While some advocated in the halls of government for the unborn, Catholic charities began reaching out even more to pregnant women and families, and that work has continued. One notable Oregon ministry of this kind were the homes begun by Father Charles Taff in the Salem area, which are still operated by Catholic community services there. Now, abortion was part of a major change for Catholic Charities in the 1990s. For more than six decades, the agency had been receiving allocations from the Civic Community Chest and then United Way. But then Planned Parenthood, also a United Way member, began offering abortions in Oregon. Not wanting to be linked, Catholic Charities withdrew from the association and has had to rely more on donors ever since. Always responding to current need, Catholic Charities began an AIDS ministry in 1992. A hospital chaplain named Father Bruce Schwikowski led the outreach to low-income AIDS patients. He convened support groups, conducted retreats, and gave spiritual direction. He opened a comfortable drop-in center so patients could pull themselves together and talk about spiritual matters in a place where they wouldn't be laughed at by peers. In 1996, the agency recognized that immigrants need lawyers as much as social workers, and so established the Immigration Legal Services Office. The agency has helped thousands of migrants who arrived in Oregon to legalize their status through proper and legal channels established by Congress. Most migrants who find their way to Catholic charities have escaped war, street violence, or domestic abuse. As the new, new millennium approached and Portland became increasingly hip and expensive, Catholic Charities of Oregon realized that affordable housing was the pressing social need. In 1999, the agency completed its first housing project, Rondell Court in Malala, providing 30 apartments to individuals and families. Catholic Charities now offers about 1,000 affordable units. And the agency doesn't just give people rooms. Catholic Charities offers services to make it more likely 
that people will succeed and stay in housing. Our developments also build beautiful communities. I can testify to that firsthand. In July, I walked over to the Kateri Park community across the road here to interview a student for a story. Well, about six other youth showed up, came on the scene to lend her support, tell jokes, and explain the intricacies of life to me. They were from Somalia, Afghanistan, Kenya, and Syria. It was indeed like a hilarious little United Nations. Homelessness obviously is a growing concern in Oregon and Catholic Charities has long addressed it. The agency opened a village of tiny houses for women in 2017 as part of a long time case management program for women who have been homeless. The idea is to help these clients transition to permanent housing. Our new child's house next door is another innovation in transitional housing. When wildfires and pandemic hit Oregon in 2020, Catholic Charities responded again, beginning a food program and a disaster relief effort. If God forbid another disaster strikes, the agency is poised to revive such programs quickly. And now in the mid 2020s, Catholic Charities is focused on four areas, helping migrants and refugees through legal channels, combating homelessness, supporting families, and developing affordable housing. In a letter to donors this year, Executive Director Natalie Wood said the agency would endure even in trying times. She said, our mission and our work are so vital and so true that we know we'll survive difficult times. Our ideals and the people we serve call us to be our best selves and create a better world. So that's a little survey of the precursors, origins, and highlights of Catholic charities. But now, let's look at three 20th century heroes who are foundations of modern Catholic social action in Oregon. The first character we have met already it's Father Edwin O'Hara, the brains behind the Catholic Children's Bureau in 1917. Raised on a 320-acre Minnesota farm, he was a member of a devout Catholic family with many equally devout Lutheran friends. Surely, young Edwin feasted on many a Lutheran casserole as on the prairie cooperation was a necessity. He answered God's call as a domestic missionary and was ordained a priest for the Archdiocese of Oregon City in 1905. As a proud Irish American in Portland, he joined a strong fraternal society called the Ancient Order of Hibernians, which still exists in some form. Now, how to put this delicately? After centuries of oppression, the Irish know how to complain elegantly. At meetings in Hibernian Hall on North Russell Street in Portland, Thick with brogues and tobacco smoke, the young priests heard Irish American laborers hold forth about unjust workplace, workplace practices and low wages. He came to know many families personally and took note of their woes. In response, he led a group of men at Portland's cathedral to begin a lumber yard to provide work for laborers unhappy in other jobs. Convinced that the church needed to advocate publicly for better conditions in addition to providing relief, Father O'Hara became a frequent public speaker on the topic of social reform. Older priests were not fans of his work because it took place outside the boundaries of strict parish life. He withstood their criticism with calm dignity and only grew in public stature. Just before Thanksgiving in 1912, an orator on a Portland street corner saw the mild looking clergyman walking past. The speaker began bashing religion, calling it a tool of the upper classes. He soon found that looks can be deceiving. Father O'Hara took his turn on the soapbox, probably adjusted his tiny wire frame spectacles, and then explained church ideas on human dignity. 
He quoted Catholic social teaching and convinced the by then growing crowd that Jesus, not Karl Marx, was the real friend of the working class. The Consumers League of Portland, formed to fight business corruption, appointed Father O'Hara to lead a committee. The committee's work would be to investigate wages and work conditions among children and women in Portland's booming industrial sector. Father O'Hara didn't like what he found. In public statements, the usually measured priest grew angry and compared some Portland factory owners to parasitic insects. The committee's work led to a seminal moment in the nation's history, which I'll discuss later. The governor named Father O'Hara to the Industrial Welfare Commission, as well as the Oregon Unemployment Committee. And he was chairman of the Portland Housing Committee, which fought for decent and affordable housing and safety codes. In 1920, Exhausted by overwork, Father O'Hara asked to move from the city of Portland to rural Eugene. And there he became a champion of fairness and justice for farmers. Later as Archbishop of Kansas City, he'd take the cause even further, pushing for collective action among Catholic farmers from sea to sea. He would die in 1956, a familiar name nationwide. In the end, I think Father O'Hara embodied the beautiful Catholic notion of both and. He supported both urban and rural causes. He was both a pious fellow and an activist intent on social justice. Modern society seems to assume a conflict between these visions, but for Edwin O'Hara, they were perfectly consistent. He knew that God loves those on the margins and he insisted that society do the same. Let's meet our next hero, who was a close collaborator with Father O'Hara. In the fall of 1912, a 26-year-old Catholic Portlander named Carolyn Gleason reported for her first day of work at the Stettler Paper Box Factory at Northwest 10th and Gleason. Her job was to affix labels on shoe boxes drawing from a massive hot cauldron of glue in the middle of the workshop. After only a few labels, the women's hands became so sticky that they had to make a long trip to a hot water station to cleanse their fingers. As they were paid by the label, this incessant cleansing was done for no wages at all and tended to corrode the skin. Over the course of three 10-hour days, Carolyn earned only damaged hands and a dollar 52 cents. In today's figures, that's $32, out, $32 for 30 hours of work. What few knew was that Carolyn Gleason was working undercover to investigate labor conditions. A University of Minnesota graduate trained as a social worker, he, she came to Portland in 1908 as a teacher at St. Mary's Academy. Not long after she arrived, she and Father O'Hara, who was a family friend, formed the Catholic Women's League to stand up for workers. It seems clear that Gleason was a powerful influence on Father O'Hara's thinking. She worked closely with him on the Consumers League Committee, investigating women and child labor. We don't know who came up with the idea of going undercover. My guess is it was Gleason, but the assignment became a key in making life better for laborers nationwide. In this blurred photo of the Industrial Welfare Commission, Gleason is seated at far left. And see who's seated at the far right? It's Father O'Hara. Gleason gave talks around the state. She also gathered more information on work conditions and turned it over to a set of Catholic lawmakers who fashioned a minimum wage bill. Some business leaders denounced the legislation as outrageous and socialistic, but the bill passed in 1913, the nation's first compulsory minimum wage law. One Portland employer referred to Gleason as, quote, that dreadful woman, unquote, which today would make a superb t-shirt. The Oregon wage law would survive court challenges with Carolyn Gleason's data playing a major role. 
Oregon's statute, shaped by Catholic social teaching, would serve as a model for other states and for the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act. Leeson would go on to investigate substandard housing in Portland and would be a major force in writing a new housing code. In 1916, at age 30, she fulfilled a childhood dream and became a Sister of the Holy Names. In religious life, she was known as Sister Miriam Teresa, and she became an important educator and leader in her order and the wider community. She was the first woman to receive a PhD from Catholic University's School of Social Work and became head of the sociology department at Merrillhurst College. She formed many Oregon social workers and was a key voice in the formation and operation of Catholic charities. I want to reshow a photograph from earlier tonight, a Catholic charity staff photo from 1954, seated front and center is Sister Miriam Teresa. In 1951, the Oregonian named her one of the most important 25 women in Oregon history. Upon her death in 1962, eulogies came not only from church leaders, but from governors, senators, and congressional representatives. And now we'll hear about the namesake of our lecture series. Here's one way to sum up the life of Monsignor Thomas Tobin. He wanted to reform Oregon society according to Catholic social teaching. An early story found by historian Sam Mertz gives us a sense of this man's approach to life. After being ordained in Rome in 1925, the day came for the young Father Tobin's first mass. Someone with means had arranged a carriage to take the new priest to the chapel. But when he saw his seminary friends would not be getting a ride, he sent the carriage away and walked with them instead. Mertz says this moment foreshadowed a lifetime of concern for those without privilege. And for almost five decades, Monsignor Tobin would promote Catholic teaching on economics, labor, politics, and public life in general. He was born in 1897 into an Irish Catholic family amid the steel mills of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He went off to the University of Notre Dame, the first in his family to attend college. In a university magazine, he wrote feisty essays in favor of Irish independence. And yes, I bet you've noticed that there's an Irish river rushing through Oregon's Catholic social action history. After graduation, he came to teach at Columbia University, later renamed the University of Portland, where he also served as boxing coach. Thankfully, he put down the gloves and discerned a vocation as a priest. After seminary in Rome, he came back to Oregon and became a protege of none other than Father Edwin O'Hara. By 1929, Father Tobin had a show on KGW radio in which he discussed matters Catholic, including social teaching. By 1930, when Father O'Hara was named a bishop, Father Tobin was ready to step in as the Oregon Catholic thought leader. In this photo, he is on the right, sharing an office with Father John Laidlaw. In 1933, he almost certainly was a key voice in the conversation about the new Catholic charities, but soon he was shipped off to Rome again to study canon law. There, Father Tobin met a group of new thinkers who were proposing that the church engage more with the modern world. The priest fell deeply in love with Catholic economic teaching, which he knew was neither Marxist nor laissez-faire, Instead, the church endorsed a market economy in which labor and management work together to ensure just compensation and safe conditions. Again, we see that lovely Catholic notion of both and. He returned to Portland and helped workers at the Archdiocese and Central Catholic High School unionized. And you know, fear not, neither one of those entities became a socialist juggernaut. The photo shows him chatting with laborers at the old St. Francis Church in Portland. Archbishop Howard was a skilled administrator, but who knew he needed an idea man, 
So he gave Father Tobin a lot of leeway. The priest began to advocate for working people by mediating labor disputes, organizing worker pension plans, and advocating for women's rights. His work settling shipbuilder disputes earned him this large photo on the front page of the Oregonian newspaper in 1943. His efforts are a remarkable example of cooperation between labor and management. Here's a photo of him at a 1943 Navy ship launching. He's to the left of the speaker. No doubt Monsignor Tobin had the regular person at heart. He asked banks to stay open later so shipbuilders could deposit their checks after work. He said mass at 5 a.m. so the early shift workers could attend. At the start of the war, he found room at St. Francis Church for classes of Japanese American children whose school had been shut down. After the war, Father Tobin stood up for Japanese Americans who had been locked away in internment camps. And he helped form the Urban League of Portland to fight discrimination against black citizens. Throughout his ministry, Father Tobin brought the language of Catholic social teaching into secular contexts. For example, he wrote that voters who opposed more money for low rent housing would be, quote, guilty of an immoral action, unquote. Like Father O'Hara and Sister Miriam Teresa, Father Tobin was a fairly theologically orthodox person who was attracted to the social teachings of the church. His life centered on the church's encounter with, as Vatican II would put it in 1965, quote, the joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of this age, unquote. So what does it all add up to? The story of Oregon Catholic social action, Catholic charities, and these three social ministry heroes. Three things, I think. First, the work of the church transcends puny and partisan political platforms. The relatively recent American political developments pressure us to choose a team we who follow Jesus in church teachings don't fit the mold of our political parties. Second, these stories show that those who are traditional in liturgy or theology can be stunning and effective advocates for those who are suffering poverty or homelessness. Third, we should realize that Portland has a noble history of pioneering Catholic social teaching and Catholic social action. I hope this history makes us feel proud, but also imposes on us an obligation to carry it forward. Thank you. So now it's question and answer time when you can tell me what I left out or got wrong or, or anything else. I'm a big boy, I won't cry, so I, that's fine. Uh, both Natalie and I will take your questions if Natalie's okay with that. And we do have microphones around the room so that our uh, viewers online can hear your question. So go ahead and raise your hand if you have a comment or a question. Um, very, oh, microphone, thank you. Um, I noticed it started out with a lot of nuns coming from other countries, uh, particularly coming to Portland to serve the, the poor and the needy. And a couple of questions come up as like, why did they do that? I mean, you know, why did they come from Antwerp to Portland in particular? Uh, and there was a second round of nuns. And also, is there other groups that came in to also, you know, help out the poor and needy back before Oregon was even a state, I guess you'd call it? To your first question, often there was a charismatic person who would travel back and forth between the New World and Europe and speak to superiors and bishops and say, I've got this brave new mission in the, in the new world. And in the case of the Sisters of Notre Dame de Namur, Joe Shewitt could maybe correct me, I believe that was DeSmet, Father DeSmet, right? Who was the famous Jesuit missionary who came to the Northwest quite early and, and established quite a few missions. Uh, I think he might have been Belgian, not sure, but anyhow, I, I believe he went back and um, 
was these sisters of Notre Dame de Namur were inspired by him. Um, the Holy Name sisters came from French Canada. And of course, we had a French Canadian priest, Francis Blanchet, who became our first bishop. So my hunch is that maybe there was some connection with him or Father Modeste Mears was another French Canadian and among our first priests. So usually there was a personal connection, but also a sense among the religious communities of moving outward and moving on and, and bringing the faith and good works to uh, people in other parts of the world. It's, it, it would be a whole nother talk to decide what, what they thought of the indigenous folks here, what their attitude towards those people were. We do know that they came with good intentions. Uh, I'll leave another lecture to just talk about how that all worked out. Uh, your, can you repeat your second inquiry? I'm not sure I even remember. <laughs> uh, oh, were there other I like groups? that answer that you gave. Were there other groups, I believe you're asking? Were there other groups? I mean, you named a couple. Usually they're nuns. <laughs> were there other groups? I mean, either let's Catholic see, or non-Catholic. Let's see. Did I, did I leave any out? Um, well, of course, the Methodist missionaries came to the Salem area very early on. I'm not familiar with their social ministry work, but I bet there was some. Um, of course, we've got the Jesuits who came pretty early on and were very dynamic and uh, thoughtful people. Um, can anyone else in the audience know if, wait for a microphone, we've got someone who might have an answer to the question here. Other groups. Um, in graduate school, social work school, I did write a history of the YWCA in Portland. And so that would be another group that had similar aims, had a um, ethnic ethic or principle around the Christian uh, and gospel values. I mean, I think, you know, there, there was a movement, but um, I don't think anybody could argue with the um, self-serving, self-sacrificing that um, th these women, um, I mean, it was incredible what they were able to do without any kind of resources in the beginning. So, Joe, do you want to say anything? I was just going to add that um, the reason we got uh, sisters from Belgium after Archbishop Blanchet was um, consecrated a bishop, he went to Rome, he went all throughout Europe on what were literally begging tours. He was asking for money and he was asking for help. And one of the places he went to was the American College at Louvain in Belgium. And he inspired a lot of priests to come over to uh, be missionaries in this, what many people thought was the Wild West. So we had a lot of priests that came from Louvain. And one historian said that the period of um, priests coming from Europe in the 1850s and 60s, there were so many coming from Belgium that, that, that she referred to them as the Belgian bulge. <laughs> and then, of course, as Ed noted, Father Blanchet coming from French Canada, you had the Sisters of the Holy Names and the Sisters of Charity of Providence. They were both founded, had their start in Montreal. So there was that connection there to bring a group of sisters out to the West. So it was a case of connections and Literally, I would say Blanchet would take anybody on two feet who was willing and able to come to help him out because he needed it. In case you're wondering why that man knows so much, that's Joe Shewick, the archivist of the Archdiocese of Portland and a, and a trained historian. When did the first St. Vincent de Paul Society start in Oregon and how were they interconnected with Catholic social justice and Catholic charities. In 1869, a group uh, at the cathedral, which I think at that point was down at Third and Stark, 
uh, opened the first St. Vincent de Paul Society in Oregon. And uh, like a lot of these guys, I think they were mostly Irishmen. I know the uh, the future, the editor of the cat, or um, Stephen McCormick was among them, a guy who uh, was the editor of the Catholic Sentinel at one time, mayor of Portland at one time. And one of the first things they did was donate a chunk of land in Northwest Portland for Providence Hospital. But I think they also carried on what we think of St. Vincent Paul carrying on today, which is families who are poor, providing food, providing clothing, uh, perhaps helping with the rent a little bit. I haven't looked at the records uh, of that, but that certainly was the case by the turn of the century that St. Vincent de Paul was doing that. And I believe it operated out of the cathedral for a while, then maybe St. Francis Parish across the river got in on the act. St. Vincent de Paul tends to be a parish-based ministry, uh, at least it is today. So I think it spread, and now there's scores of St. Vincent de Paul conferences here. As far as their interaction with social justice causes, well, that that makes us ask, you know, what, what's the distinction between charity and social justice? Uh, you, you'll notice that when I was talking about Father O'Hara, he, he made the point that in addition to relieving suffering, we need to advocate in the halls of power to try to make sure that the suffering doesn't happen anymore. I don't think that's St. Vincent de Paul's game. They do very well what they do at, the, at their charity, and but I don't think that was necessarily what they were going for. In fact, I don't think anyone was really doing that until maybe around the turn of the century um, with, with maybe people like Father Black and then certainly Father O'Hara. Oregon was a very interesting political case at the turn of the the 20th century uh, had a very progressive government. They, we voted in the referendum system where voters could make laws by voting. And then in 1912, again, well ahead of the country, women were given the vote. And I'm just saying, I think maybe that affected some of our laws and social policies. I do want to point out a few things I know I left out. Uh, I talked about Blanche House in Old Town, but Old Town also had a number of ministries that had Catholic beginnings, kind of, including the big one called Transition Projects, formerly Burnside Projects. I used to work there, but I believe it was founded by a priest, uh, a Catholic group, um, but then, you know, became kind of a secular thing. Um, Sisters of the Road Cafe was founded by a Jesuit volunteer, I believe, Jenny Nelson, a Jesuit volunteer and uh, you know, really understood those roots. Those are things I talked about. There was a little cafe called the Cardinal Cafe founded by a, a priest down there that didn't last too long. But Old Town Portland was a place where there were a lot of Catholic uh, charitable enterprises. One of my favorites was called um, Outreach Ministry in Burnside founded by a Franciscan sister named Maria Francis Waugh who was, oh, you didn't want to get in her way. And if you had a real problem in your social service agency, someone you couldn't handle, you, you called 1-800-SISTER Maria Francis, and she would take them on and manage their money and their mental illnesses and uh, really miss that lady. She's, she's no longer with us. Anybody think of anything else that, any other social ministries that we didn't talk about? Very good. Anything from online? Okay. So our time to close is upon us. We want to especially thank Joe Shewitt, the archivist for the Archdiocese of Portland. Thank you for helping us gather all of this history. And I'll remind you again about the donation box and the QR codes outside in case you want to support our work. And I want to thank you for joining us for this look at the legacy of Catholic social teaching in our area. Pray that we at Catholic Charities and the whole church continue to apply the principles to this world in need. Good night. I just wanted to read one thing from online real quick. Um, 
Catherine Trevison says, this presentation was really eye-opening. I am so amazed by the Catholic roots of so many institutions that have kept Portland and Oregon more humane and loving places. I have recently learned the average age of the Holy Name Sisters is over 80. How do we carry their mission forward? Well, there's two left in the historical archives. Of yourself, take a look. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much.